presence just hearing about you. We want to feel your presence on tonight. So we just thank you for all the ministry that have went forth up to now. And bless your word and bless the hearers of your word in Jesus' name. If you got your Bible in hand, let's go ahead and do our prayer and request it over God. Heavenly Father, today I will be taught the word. The word I'm taught will go into my spirit. It will change me and transform me. After hearing your word, my life, the life of my family, the life of my church family, and the life of my community will never be the same. Never, never, never. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you on tonight. Amen. very special welcome to all of our first time visitors thank you so much for being here with us on tonight amen it is our second wednesday that we're here and uh please again uh be patient with us as we continue to fine tune some things uh like our sound for sure uh but god is doing amazing things in the midst of us amen so we thank god for that uh i saw pastor ivan that pastor ivan right there Hello, Pastor Evan, how you doing? Jubilee Church in the house. <laughs> Amen. That's a wonderful, blessed man of God. Uh, for Destiny and Faith, if you didn't know, we was together at one of our real and senior pastoral lines together. And uh, he just pulled me to the side and he said, Pastor, the Lord told me to put this seed into the building fund. And so he gave us a great seed. So thank you so much for believing in us. Thank you so much for believing in the work, amen. And uh, now you get an opportunity to experience it, huh? Yeah. <laughs> amen. Well, listen, uh, I'm not going to hold you, but uh, I do want to share a few things. Because it's very important that we understand what God is doing in our house. He's doing a lot of things in the world he created. But it's important that we know what he's doing in our house. For each one of you, you have your own good address, and God is doing many wonderful things at your good address. But what he's doing at your address may not be being done at somebody else's address. So God is doing some things here. It's very important for us that uh, the first, the first month, the first services, they are all are dedicated unto the Lord. But it's kind of like getting in a plane and you have a destination. No matter where your destination is at, you got to start off at point A to get to point B. But if you don't get to the right terminal, then you can wind up in a place that you never bought the ticket. And so it's important for us that we start off right. And God's been ministering to my heart. I'm telling you, he's been ministering to my heart about start off right. Don't just come into the building and be overwhelmed. But start off right with me in the building. Start off right with my spirit in the building. Because we can be in this beautiful edifice, but if the power is not here, all we are is just people in a building with no power. And I don't know about y'all, but I got to continue to see the power of God. I have to continue to see the hand of God. And so these few services that we have had and that we're going to continue to have, he has put it in my heart that these are the first fruits unto him. First fruits unto him. And God is big into first fruits. And we can come and we can have programs and we can have our plan and we can have our small groups and we can do all the stuff that makes our ministry seemingly be effective and keep the spirit of God out. Because we, are, we have programmed him out. We've planned him out. But how many of you guys know that the Spirit of God makes all the difference in the world? The Spirit of God makes all the difference in the world. So it is a new beginning for us here. It is a new beginning. It's a new book that God is writing where we are concerned in this location at 409 Patterson. I'm so glad we're not written. We don't have a written spirit on us no more, y'all. We, 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 oh, we, we listen, we're about to own this here. Amen. And not too long in the distant future. But one of the things God was sharing with me was that wherever my spirit is, there is liberty, 
There is freedom. There is wisdom. There is prosperity. There is life and life evermore. But my spirit is the one that unleashes the life in the life of a believer. And I want to come in here and I want to be obedient to God. Because I came here to announce to our church, it's time for revival. It's time for revival. It's time for revival. We can do a lot of things, but if we don't revive our spirit, if we don't invite the Holy Spirit in to stir us up, to move us, to move us into a better place, into a higher place, to greener pastures, then we'll just come in here and we'll just do a lot of movement, a lot of activity, and we won't see the power of God. And there's many of us believing for new beginnings. How many of you guys believe in for new beginnings? Yes, yes, yes. That's, that's every one of us in this house. And God has set such a time as now for us to begin to prepare our hearts for new beginnings. Prepare our hearts for change. New beginnings will always bring change. Great change for us. When we talk about revival, we're talking about something that's inside of us that needs to be revived. Throughout the ages and the years, it has been expressed in many different ways. The great awakening, the dawn of a new day, starting fresh, a fresh start. No matter how you phrase it, it's all about revival, revival. And if there's something inside of you that you know you need to be revived, let me qualify for a second. How do you know you need to be revived? Well, my joy hadn't been high like I wanted to be. My faith hasn't been high like I wanted to be. My confidence in God hasn't been high like I wanted to be. My love walk hasn't been as powerful as I needed to be. All these things, if you have, if you say to yourself, I need more, it means that you need a revival. And the only one that can revive the things inside of us is God through the power of his Holy Spirit. Christian revival and renewal and outpouring are times of refreshing. And that's what we need in our lives is time of refreshing. No matter what you call it, it's something that has been happening ever since the first outpouring on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came down. And they was up there in the upper room waiting for a new beginning, waiting for a fresh experience. And then all of a sudden, what Jesus promised came on the day of Pentecost. Charles G. Finney says this here. A revival breaks the power of the world and of sin over Christians. It brings them to such a vantage point that they get a fresh impulse towards heaven. They have a new foretaste of heaven and new desires after being reunited with God once again. And the charm of the world is broken and the power of sin is overcome. And sin has been a part of our life ever since the fall of man. And that's what sometimes so easily besets us is the weight of sin. Psalms 85 and 6, the psalmist says this here. Will you not revive us again, O Lord, that your people may rejoice in you? When we are revived, we have the opportunity to rejoice in God from a place of freedom and a place of surrender. A revival is nothing else than a new beginning of obedience to God. It's nothing else than a new beginning of obedience to God. Revival is falling in love with Jesus all over again. You remember when you got saved? Remember that great experience you had where somebody invited you to church and it was your first experience and you never experienced the power of God? Some of us need to go back and remember your, our first experience with the one we love because God is wanting to reignite that love, not just to what you first experienced, but to a whole nother level. I was reading about an aircraft, 747. In order for them to reach their optimum altitude in, in reaching what they call that cruising status or that cruising altitude, they have to reach an altitude of 
between 31 and 38,000 feet in the air, 1,000 feet in the air, between 31,000 and 38,000 feet in the air. And do you know that for, them to, for, for the passenger to have a smooth experience in that plane, that they have to rise above the clouds? Because while you're flying in the clouds, it's all kind of turbulence. And sometimes we have clouds in our life that gives us turbulence and we're trying to find that altitude where we're just cruising where we can hear the Lord says okay unbuckle your seatbelt you're free to walk around the cabin you're free to walk around the cabin but that's what revival does to us it's, it puts us in a place where we can have a visitation from God which brings life to the Christians who have been sleeping and God want to restore us that's what a great awakening is all about there was a time where you, heard, where you heard about renewals and great revivals going on all over our nation. You don't too much hear about that anymore like we used to in recent past, about the last 20 years or so. But I sense in my prayer time that God is saying that I want to do a new thing in this new season. And he wants to revive us. The Lord... And my desire and your desire and our dedication should be, Lord, make me to be different. Lord, make me to be unique. Set me apart and fill me with your Holy Spirit. That should be our cry. Set me apart and fill me with your Holy Spirit. It started with Adam and Eve back in the Garden of Eden. And God created this perfect place to raise up a perfect family. And then the enemy came in and slithered in and deceived Adam and Eve. And they ate from that forbidden tree that God told them not to eat from. And from that moment on, sin was in the earth. And that's not one of us that had not been born into sin. But God had already had a plan. But it started with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve had a son named Seth. And Seth was the third son of Adam and Eve because they had Cain and Abel. And we know that one brother killed the other brother. And the brother that was left li living, a curse was pronounced on that brother. But that brother wound up having kids. And one of the kids that they had, I'm sorry, that brother wound up having kids, but the third child that Adam and Eve had was named Seth. And the moment they had Seth, the people began to praise the Lord again. They began to serve the Lord again. They began to cry out to the Lord again. Sin was alive and well and multiplying in the earth until God decided enough is enough. And he decided to get rid of all of mankind and start over with one family. He found a man named Noah. And through, that, and through Noah, he judged all of humanity. And through God's divine instruction, Noah built a big boat. Somebody say a big boat. Yes, that we call an ark. And God gave Noah instructions. And the instruction was to build a boat, gave him dimensions to how to build a boat, and told him what animals should be on the boat, and keep the door open just in case anybody else want to come and be saved on the boat. But I'm sending, I'm sending a flood, I'm sending rain. Something that Noah had never experienced. He had never experienced rain up until that point. He didn't even know what rain was because it wasn't raining back in Noah's day. He didn't even know what a boat was. Not a big boat like that. But he followed God's instruction. I want to tell you that one of the signs of revival is obedience. One of the signs of, a, of revival is that, Lord, I want to get back in right alignment. I want to get back to that perfect place. I don't just want to be in your permissive will. I want to be in your perfect will. Do I have anybody want to be in God's perfect will? Perfect will. You know, he permits us to do a lot of things. He permits us to do a lot of things, but if we're going to get what we call that hundredfold blessing on our life, 
is going to be because we're not accepting the permissive thing is that we have a desire for the perfect things of God. Even though we're not perfect and we're going to continue to fall and miss the mark, our heart should be that, Lord, even though I'm not perfect, I desire to be perfect. I'm on my journey to become perfect. From faith to faith and from glory to glory. Revival. Revival. It's when the Holy Spirit breaks out so fully that God's manifested presence fills our hearts and the spaces we occupy. Revival comes because God himself desires to be with us. That's why revival comes. The only reason why, when he comes, when he decides and sees that we are hungering and we are thirsting after a move of God in our life, in our thought life, in our hearts, in our marriages, in our home. When he sees the pureness of our worship to him and the pureness of our desire to him when we pray to him, when nobody else is listening, he'll come down and he will come and make himself at home with us. And so we want that presence to be right here in this house because nothing less will do. Sin. Through God's divine instruction, Noah built a big boat called the ark after the boat was built, God sent a great rain that lasted 40 days. And Noah's family was the only one left alive on the boat which came, which became a place of salvation for his family. 40 years, 40 days, he was on that boat. It would be 400 years later that God would reveal himself to a man named Abram. Y'all know Abram. We know him as Abraham from the land called Ur. God took him out of a land, uh, his land called Ur, and put him on a brand new path and changed his name and changed his destiny. Anytime God can take you from one place and point you in a different direction where life is concerned with him, He'll change your name and he'll change your destiny. He'll change your, tra your trajectory. And it's important that we obey God when he comes and says, I want to use you. Once again, God wanted to do something new. He wanted a new beginning for a special people that will come from the seed of Abraham and be called the children of Israel, God's chosen people. The thing about God is that what I found out that when God chooses us, he mocks us. He mocks us. Now, whether you know it or not, because you may not know what the mark look like. If the Bible talks about, or we used to talk about the mark of the beast, 666, but God has his own mark, and it's not numbers or anything else. The mark that he has for the believers, the mark that he has for his sons and daughters is his presence being in you. His spirit, that's the mark that when people see you, they see God. When people see you, they see God. When people talk to you, they hear God. You can just walk into a room and the presence of God that's on you is in the room. But the enemy will always try to discount that presence and make you think you're not carrying his presence. But I'm telling you that if you have received Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior. And you have acknowledged the Holy Spirit inside of you. You are marked with a mark that cannot be erased. You have a power source inside of you that all God want to do is teach you and show you how to flip the switch. And when you flip the switch and let God be God, and not try to dumb down God or hide God or keep God in the closet because of who you're around, just be who God called you to be. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Now, 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 in the times we live in, that can be very challenging. Because uh, worshiping God is not a, you know, a, 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 a wide thing that people are doing these days. And as we read the scriptures here in a minute, you'll see what I'm talking about. But revival begins with the obedience of God. Abraham's who whose name was changed to Abraham, became obedient to the plan of God for his life. 
God did as he said in Abraham's seed, the people of Israel multiplied so much so that they intimidated Pharaoh and they enslaved the people of God for another 430 years. And sometimes you can intimidate the enemy because you're growing and you belong to God. And his job is to come and trip you up, put things in your way to make you stop serving God, stop coming to church, stop believing in God, stop praying to God, the one and only true God that can deliver you and set you free. Well, Pharaoh became intimidated by the growth and the multiplication of God's people, and he enslaved them for 430 years. Then come on the scene after 430 years, comes on the scene a man by the name of Moses. And God raised them up to be a deliverer. But after they get delivered from out of bondage, out of Egypt, he brings them to the promised land, to the edge of the promised land. But they did not have the faith to cross over because of the giants and the challenges. I want to tell you something that in the revival, when God revives your heart, revives your mind and put a different level of faith on you, now all of a sudden, you got to realize that it's not you fighting the battle. It's God that has done went before you. And guess what? The battle that you got to present yourself at, he already fought the battle. And you already won the battle. All you got to do is show up to the battle. Tell your neighbor, I just got to show up. Just show up. Don't make a difference what it looked like. Just show up. You say, Pastor, how can you say that with such great faith? Because look what we're sitting in. Look what we're sitting in. When they said it couldn't be done. Against all odds, God said yes when man said no. I'm telling you that when we get revived, there's something on the inside of us. There's a giant on the inside of you that God wants to come alive inside of you. But long as we keep dumbing ourselves down and not attaining to the level that God has built us for. Tell your neighbor I'm not satisfied at the level that I'm living at. I'm not satisfied with the joy that I have right now. I'm not satisfied with the faith that I've been living by. No, 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 no. You cannot be satisfied. But when you're not satisfied, it's, it's the Lord himself that will come fill your mouth with words of faith and words of life. And whatever you say by faith, Jesus says that I'm going to take that. And whatever you pray to the Father, in my name, I'm going to make it happen for you. That's the word, somebody. That's the word, somebody. Until the man by the name of Moses would be raised up to become the deliverer of God's people. God told Moses to go to Pharaoh and tell them to let my people go. And sometimes we just got to go to the devil and say, my father in heaven told me to tell you to let me go. Let my kids go. Let my kids go. They don't belong to you. Let my destiny go. Let my marriage go. Let my peace go. Let my love go. You and we got to talk to that enemy flat-footed. He said, well, you done done all that you can do. Stand. And stand, therefore, seeing the salvation of the Lord. God will not let you down. He will never let you down. Revival starts at the point of deliverance. At the point of deliverance. The moment you are free from what you have been enslaved to, the moment you are free from what you have been in bondage to, revival comes. It's a new beginning. It's a new day. The moment that you are set free. And I just believe that at the end of our journey, the Jewish journey, the revival journey, because it don't happen in one service. It don't happen with one message. It's a journey to get to the place of freedom. Freedom in your spirit. Freedom in your thought life. Freedom in your conversation. And God wants to stir us up. And after 40 years of being in the wilderness, Moses now 
is on the mountaintop telling them I can't go with you, but it's time for you to go into the promised land to possess the promise that God has for you after 40 years. I was talking to Pastor Mary earlier. I said, I think God did Moses a favor. You know, the thing is, is that when, uh, when God was talking to Moses, and he told Moses, he says, listen, I know you, they've been murmuring and complaining. I know they've been getting on your last nerve. But listen, go to that rock, speak to that rock, because they was thirsty, they was in the desert, I understand. But I want you to talk to that rock. I don't want you to speak to that rock out of your frustration. When Moses was so frustrated with the people, he didn't talk to the rock. He wound up hitting the rock. And when he hit the rock, he disobeyed God's instructions. And we never know when we disobey one instruction how it will keep us out of the promised land. Because he disobeyed one seemingly insignificant instruction. He done delivered over two million people out of bondage. To me, he would have favor. God, you know, I, I hit it, but can I have some grace? Can I have some mercy? But apparently, God had Moses at a higher standard. And he didn't allow Moses to cross over with him, with the, with the Israelites. But then, in the, in, in somewhere in the four Gospels, you see Jesus going up to the Mount of Transfigurations. And guess who you see on that mountain of transfiguration? Moses. Moses. It doesn't mean that he didn't go to heaven. He wasn't a part of God's plan. He was always a part of God's plan. And so he's seeing Moses and Elijah and Jesus talking to him. And you got Peter and John and James witnessing everything that's going on. I wonder what they thought. Because they, they had the Bible. They have the they had all the first five books of the Bible that told, talked about what happened. But I wonder what they thought. Man, look at the grace of God. Moses didn't get the opportunity to go into the promised land. But look at the grace of God. He's still in the, the most high place. God used Moses. After 40 years of coming into relationship with God, they finally came into the promised land. Revival kicks in the moment you walk into the thing that God promised you. The moment you walk into the very thing that God promised you, revival kicks in. Let me give you an example. Remember you bought something that you always wanted and revival sprung up in your heart through jubilation, through excitement? Wow, yes, I never thought I would have it. I got the car that I wanted. I got the dress that I wanted. I got the boo. Oh, I'm sorry. I never thought I would have been in a relationship. I'm just so in love. Revival is going on all up in your heart, all up in your mind. The position you got that you thought you would never get, but favor came in. God came in, made a way out of no way. You know you didn't qualify for that, so you went back home just totally elated that God would love me so much to make a way out of no way. What I didn't qualify for, he qualified me for that. Revival sprung up in your heart. Revival sprung up in your heart. Revival kicks in the moment you walk into the thing that God promised you. Revival com comes because God himself desires to be with us. Revival is the revealing of God and his promises in our life. The enemy is always trying to make a counterfeit, something fake. A fake image of God look like the real thing, look like the real deal. So once again, the enemy would come in and imitate God, a small g God, and get the people to follow idols instead of following God. And oftentimes, we're following, we're following these little g gods, these idols. An idol is something that you give more time and attention to than God. Let me say it again. An idol is anything that you give more time and attention to and value to than God. So that can be an, anything in your life can become an idol. Anything in your life can become an idol. But God becomes real jealous when we start replacing Lil G God with the only and one, with the only and one true God. 
the Bible talks about in Judges chapter 21 and 25. The last out of all the Judges, out of all the chapters in Judges, the last sentence in Judges reads like this here. In those days there were no king, which means there was no authority. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Kind of like this 2019 century we're living in. People are calling wrong, right, and right, wrong. How can we have a revival and we flipping everything? I, I, I said something a few uh, 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 messages ago, sermons ago, and I was talking about different codes that we live by. Everybody live by a code. Everybody live by a standard. Whether you have written your code down or whether you haven't written your code down. How you know you got a code? There's some things that you will do and there's some things that's non-negotiable. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. I'm not, I, 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 that's not a part. That's not who I am, right? And, 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 and I'm not talking about all of it being uh, associated with the word of God or the prince of God. The principle of God. It's just something that you don't do. You don't do. And we're living in a time where we are elevating our code over God's code. Because God has his own code. If we're gonna, if we're gonna see revival, if we're gonna experience God's revival, then we have to be willing to lay aside our code for God's code. You say, well, how do you know uh, what my code is? It's some things that you said to yourself and you say to others that, nah, I ain't gonna never do that. Mm -mm, mm -mm. I ain't gonna never let that man talk to me like that. The moment he talked to me like that, I'm getting a divorce. It's done. We're done with. Okay, that's your code. God's code is that I am the God of reconciliation. I am the God that hates divorce, right? That's, that's, that's his code. Now, Jesus was asked this question. Jesus was asked this question, and the question was this here. That, uh, is it okay that I divorce my wife? And Jesus says, well, Moses was given the authority to let individuals get a divorce from their spouse. But then Jesus come back and says, it was not so in the very beginning. It was not so in the very beginning. So he's taking them back to the beginning, the genesis of a thing. So back when God started and started writing his word and giving us his principles and giving us his code and giving us everything that he wanted us to live by. He says, in the beginning, no, 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 no. Yes, you can give a petition of divorce to your wife, but I want you to know that in the beginning, that wasn't God's code, that wasn't God's plan. That wasn't his best for your life. The code. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. God always is working to the outcome he desires to see in our life. Just when it looks like, here we go again. Just when it looks like the enemy done got an advantage over us. Just when it looks like, okay, they're back in bondage again. They're following idols again. Then God come back and say, I got an ultimate plan. But let me introduce somebody else into this storyline by a woman by the name of Ruth. Ruth enters into the story because she's all of God's, what I call the long game, the long game. He's all, she, she's all a part of the loan game. Ruth comes in, marry a man named Boaz. Between Ruth and Boaz, they have a baby by the name of Obed. Obed wound up having a child named Jesse. Jesse wound up having a son named David, King David. Then God comes in and make a promise to King David and says, there will always, been, there will always be a lineage on your throne. I will always have somebody from your bloodline on the throne. Somebody would say, well, that could have been his great-great-grandson. No, through David, we will soon find out that through his lineage, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ himself, will be born through that lineage. The Lord promised David that there will always be someone in his bloodline on that throne. But when we get to the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, it only have four chapters, only have four chapters. When he gets to the last book of the fourth chapter, 
he closed that chapter up. We would not hear from heaven for another 400 years. We would not hear from God for another 400 years. Can you imagine living in a time where you don't hear the, the, from God, you don't feel his spirit? We can come over here and we can sing certain songs and it just moves us. There was a song that we were singing. It brought people from their chair to the front on their knees because they felt the anointing of God. Can you imagine not being able to feel God's presence? Can you imagine that, 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 that we have gotten to a place that we enjoy a 30-fold 30 30 of his presence? And God says, I want to give you more than that. But you got to be hungry for that. You got to be desiring that. You got to be praying for that. You got to be coming for that. And I tell you right now, I don't know about anybody else, but I want more of God. I want more of God. I don't want more of religion. I want more of God. I want more of God. After 400 years of silence, Jesus Christ, the anointed one of Israel, steps out of eternity into time. The one we call the Lion of Judah. The greatest deliverer of all times. The one that would set the captives free. The enemy has no answer when it comes to Jesus. I want you to know that the enemy has no answer when it comes to Jesus. Because the word says that every knee should bow, every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ himself is the Lord of our life, is the Lord of this world. When you start putting Jesus up front, Jesus up front in your relationship, Jesus up front on your job, Jesus up front in your community, there's no answer that the devil have for Jesus. If you want a champion, I dare you to make Jesus Christ your champion. Not just your Savior, but your Lord. He's the greatest redeemer that has ever been. Moses delivered over two million. He has delivered the entire world. Those that would confess Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. God the Father reveals himself in the Old Testament. And we have Jesus who revealed himself in the New Testament. Jesus was the physical embodiment of the Father on earth. When we go down to John chapter 14, John writes some stuff down. I, I want to read some, some, some things to you. We're going to close here in a minute. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is, su and it is sufficient for us. Then Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? You only can see the Father through Jesus, through discerning eyes. Through discerning eyes. Verse 10 says, do you not believe that I am, the, I am in the Father and the Father is in me? He says, the words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Oh, my God. But the Father who dwells in me is he who does the work. Whatever you see, whatever you see, it's not, it's not me. It's the Father that's living in me. I don't do nothing unless the Father tells me to do it. Then he tells the people in another conversation. He said, if you don't believe in me, at least believe in the works that I've done. Believe in the blind eyes that I open. Believe when I call the lame to walk. Believe when I fed over 5,000 plus people. Believe when I brought Lazarus from the grave. I just spoke his name and he just got up and said, hello, I'm back. Believe when I sent my word to that centurion soldier's servant. And the, soul, and, and the servant was just healed by just Jesus sitting in the word. He said, if you don't believe nothing else, because some of us are like doubting Thomas. I won't believe until I can touch the nail print of his hand. Let me see that that's you, Jesus. I, I, I got to see the nail print. But I'm telling you that we're living in a time and an hour that God want to see our faith without the physical evidence. 
He says, believe. But the Father who dwells in me does the work. Jesus wasn't about taking the credit. He was just an instrument. He was just an instrument. I wonder if we would surrender ourselves as instruments to a living God. And we would attend our ears to heaven. And if we could hear what heaven is telling us about ourselves. Forget about anything else. Forget about your relationship. Forget about your finances. I want you to be about you. Can you hear God for yourself? For the next step that God wants you to take. For the next decision God wants you to make. Can you hear God for yourself? Revival is all about awakening the Spirit of God inside of us. In John chapter 1, verse 1 through 5, the Word says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things that were made were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life that was in him was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it, did not even understand the light that was coming from heaven. Revival comes when light comes out of darkness. Light represents hope, it represents life, and it represents happiness. When you're lighthearted, you're happy. You got the joy of the Lord on you. But when you're waiting, you ain't happy. When you got stuff going on in your mind, you ain't happy. When Listen, when you got fears going on in your heart, you're not happy. There's no light there. Anytime fear comes in, it diminishes the light and brings darkness. When darkness is in a room, light comes and the darkness flee. Darkness cannot stand against light. When the sun comes up, the darkness flees and the light take over. I don't know nobody who want to live in darkness. It get cloudy too many days in, in Lafayette sometime. And I'm like, Lord, I can't wait for the sun to come out. I mean, these have been some beautiful days we've had today and, 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 and yesterday and today. Some beautiful days. The sun is out. Nice temperature around. Can you imagine your life being like that? That every morning you wake up, no matter what it looks like on the outside, on the inside, the light of God is shining on the inside. That no matter what the enemy come try to bring your way in that day, there's a light inside of you that can pierce through the darkness of that situation. And the light of God, which is the hope of God, can come through and manifest his presence. Isaiah chapter 42 verse 16 says, I will bring the blind by the way and they did, that they did not know. I will lead them in the paths they have not known. I will make darkness light. Look, he says, I will make darkness light before them and crooked places straight. These things I will do for them and not forsake them. God says, I will never forsake you. And whatever's crooked in your life, I'm going to make it straight. Whatever, wherever we find darkness, I'm going to come in. I'm going to flood that area with light. Because I'm all about illuminating every area of your life. So if you feel that there's something that's just not right, I dare you to give it to God. I dare you to open up your heart and say, God, come in and revive me in this area of my life, God. The manifest presence of God. John 1.14 says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's Jesus himself. And we beheld his glory. Oh, my God. Can you imagine John? We wasn't back there walking with Jesus. We didn't see him do all the miracles that he'd done. That he done. We didn't hear him teach profound principles of the kingdom. We didn't hear that. But can you imagine John, who witnessed everything? He said, we beheld his glory. We beheld his glory. The glory as only the begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. I don't know about nobody, 
but I'm a satisfied customer. I'm a satisfied customer of his grace, of his mercy. Don't know about you, but when I bought into Jesus, I bought into everything that he came with. He will always give you something. It's not like a money back guarantee type thing. He says, taste and see. Oh, taste what? Taste me. <laughs> taste what? Taste you some Jesus and see if he will not give you what he promised you. But the only way to taste him is not by your physical tongue. It's about your spirit, man, being open up to receive what God has for you. You've not been happy. You've not been satisfied. You've not been pleased. And rightly so. But it's not God's fault. Maybe we just hadn't opened up enough. Maybe we just hadn't surrendered enough. And we beheld his glory. We beheld his glory. John 11, 54 and 55 says, Therefore Jesus no longer continued to walk publicly among the Jews, but went away from there to the country near the wilderness and to a city called Ephraim. And there he stayed with his disciples. Now the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went up to Jerusalem out of the country before the Passover to purify themselves. But they was going to see Jesus. Now you got to understand, we're in a holy time right now. In a little while, we're going to be we're going to be celebrating Resurrection Sunday. And right here, we're leading up to Passover. That would be Palm Sunday for us. We're leading up to Passover. Here, the people are coming from far and near coming into the city, getting ready for the Passover. But they're looking to see Jesus. They're looking to see if Jesus is going to be in the temple. Why? Because you know what Jesus said to his mama when they went to another festival while he was a child. And he went off by himself. And they left him in the city while they went on back to their home. They found out that Jesus is not with them. Little boy Jesus is not with them. They go back. They find little boy Jesus. When they found him, his mother said, boy, where you been? And Jesus says, did you not know that I will be in my father's house? That I will be about his business? From that point on, he was about his father's business. So they knew him that if they was going to see Jesus during the Passover, I wonder what kind of teaching he's going to have. I wonder what the word is going to be. I can't wait to hear the word. I couldn't imagine them walking with their donkeys, with their kids, with the food, with everything that they did in that day. Just, just exciting, waiting to hear from Jesus. Only to get there and find out that Jesus is not there. Because you read a few sections up, he had just brought Lazarus from the dead and the Pharisees and the Sadducees were saying but hold up he making a name for himself he messing up our plan or oh, we need to figure out how we're going to take him out and so they looked to stone him they looked to kill him and when Jesus heard about that they was looking to kill him because they didn't like what Jesus was doing was messing up their plan then Jesus just removed himself or oh, he was present but he wasn't public and sometimes we can come to church and he can be present, but he ain't public. Sometimes you can go to work and Jesus living inside of you. He's present, but he ain't public. Uh, your conversation don't sound like he lives in, inside of you. Your action don't look like he living inside of you. Oh, he's present, but he's not public in your life. Uh, and when people these days, listen, when we come to the church, we're looking for a public Jesus to help us with what ails us, to deliver us, to deliver us from what's holding us back, to set our course, to reset our course, to reset our trajectory where our destination is concerned. Only one person can do that. And that's why I talked earlier. Oh, I love the church. I love the lights. I love the sound. I love the praise and worship. But if I can't find no Jesus, all I did was had a good presentation. But I don't know about you, but I want Jesus. I want a revival in this church. 
I want, I, want, I want the Spirit of God to be so strong in us and in this temple that when individuals come in here bind, bound up with whatever may be holding them back, holding them down, keeping them from living the best they can live in God, I want those shackles broken off. I want the yokes destroyed. I want the ropes burnt off. So I'm just not happy being a city on the hill. I want to be a city on the hill with some power. Do I have anybody want some power up in this house? You need some power in your relationships, power in your thought life, power in your body, power in your finances, some power. Some power. The Old Testament revealed the Father. The New Testament reveal Jesus. The times we live in now reveals the Holy Spirit. Tell your neighbor the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. You see, they missed the Father in the Old Testament. They missed the Father. They wanted to believe. They wanted to believe the Father. They wanted to believe that the God of Moses, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, they wanted to believe in him, but they couldn't be consistent with believing with him. Then Jesus came. They wanted to believe in Jesus, but I don't know about all of that, but they wanted to believe in him. But they didn't maximize everything that Jesus came to deliver in that dispensation of time. But Jesus says that I have to go. I have to go because as long as I stay with y'all, my power is only available to the immediate area that I'm located in. But if I leave, if I leave and I go back to God, go back to the Father, I'm going to send you a comforter. I'm going to send you a helper. And it won't just be in my immediate area because it's a spirit. I'm going to send my spirit to the earth. And whoever received my Holy Spirit and allowed my spirit to dwell in them, and own them, they will have an open heaven over their lives. And they will live a blessed life. Somebody say, a blessed life. A blessed life. A blessed life. A blessed life. But the fruits of the Spirit, which is what the Holy Spirit gives us, the fruits of the Spirit, you know what that is. That's that, that's that thing that was somebody getting on your last nerve and you ain't got the patience for them. And then all of a sudden something super hits on your patience. That's the fruit of the Spirit. We call it long-suffering. We call it patience, right? When you know you don't have the power to forgive a wrong that was done to you, something supernatural come out of you through the Holy Spirit, through the fruits of the Spirit, and says, I want my love to cover that wrong. No, you don't have the power. You don't have the power to love. But through my Holy Spirit, I'm going to put something super on your love walk. And some of us need something super on our love walk. Thank you for that one little clap. I appreciate that. Let an offense happen. Let, let, let one little offense happen. I want to see how quick you are to forgive. How quick you are to let love cover that wrong. The favor. The favor of God. What is the favor of God? The favor of God is the presence of God. It's the presence of God. Favor is not just open doors for somebody to give you a good job, give you a hookup, give you $100 before you leave the service. I take that dude. But the, the favor of God is the presence of God. Because when people see the presence on your life, it'll open up doors you can't open. It'll shut doors that, that you're not supposed to walk through. The favor of God. But in order for that to happen, I'm going to close with this one thing here. In order for that to happen, we have to, we have to commit ourselves to living a holy life. I, I, I'm saying the big H word. You don't too much hear about the big H word. But we have to be committed to living a holy life. A holy life. A holy life. A life with integrity. A life with character. That's the presence of God. When we can live a holy life before God. And not live a raggedy life before God. 
if, 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 if the house of God is going to be filled with people that don't know him yet, they're looking at you who say you know him. But when they look at you and they see that your walk ain't tight, not that you're perfect, but your walk ain't tight, but yet you got all kind of scriptures to go with your untight walk, There's another H word that come to mind. Hypocrite. And nobody, nobody want to follow somebody fake. I'm, I'm, I'm good. Stay right where you at. Stay right where you at. I'm good. Keep me in a holy place. Keep me in a holy place. Because we're talking about revival. But the revival we want to see first have to begin with us because we have a race to run we have a race to run but in order for us to run that race we have to cast aside every sin and every weight that so easily beset us you know what your weight is you know what your sin is but I'm asking you and, and I ain't talking about fasting we just got through fasting I ain't talking about fasting I'm just talking about being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm talking about discipline. I'm talking about getting up tomorrow and saying, no to sin. No, I'm not cursing today. No, I'm not lying today. No, I'm not being pretentious today. No, I'm not going to be mean today. No, I'm not going to be arrogant today. I'm just asking you to get up in the morning with something on your mind that I want to work on this. Do I have anybody that, that needs to work on something? Need to work on something. Yes, 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 yes. I want you to put some armor, some armor all on your spirit. Let it shine for God. Amen. You received that word on tonight. Amen. Amen. Amen.